pre-K to third grade national work group 2014-2015 webinar series. I'm Mimi Howard, Policy and Systems Advisor at School Readiness Consulting, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. Today we're looking at a very important piece of an effective pre-K to third grade continuum, full day kindergarten. We will hear from a group of experts who will be exploring this issue from a variety of perspectives ranging from the theoretical to the practical. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping things and ways for you to engage. First, everyone except for the speakers will be muted throughout the webinar. At various points in the presentation, polling questions will be posted. Please take a moment to answer the questions as they come up. And also feel free to pose questions using the chat box on the right of your screen. I'll be monitoring those throughout the webinar, and we have about 20 minutes at the end for our presenters to respond to all your questions. For the technically savvy among you, you can follow the conversation on Twitter at hashtag pre -K third and also at hashtag B through eight. That's hashtag B T H R U letter or number eight. So again, today's focus is on full day kindergarten. Where are we and where are we going with regard to providing highly effective programs as part of an aligned pre-K to third grade continuum? I'm going to give a brief framing and then we will dive into four great presentations from our panel of experts. Okay, as we get started, please take a moment to let us know who is joining us by responding to this polling question. This will help our speakers make sure they are addressing your comments to the right audience. So as you are responding to the polling question, I want to say again how glad we are that you have joined us today. We know you're extremely busy and that your schedules are full, and we hope that the presentations are informative and that what you will hear will add to your work and spark some concrete next steps for each of you. Okay, let's take a look at the results of the first polling question. Lots of others. Interesting. Well, when we get to the Q&A, it will be, we'll be great to hear from all of you and um, who you are, and hopefully we can meet all your needs as we move throughout the rest of this presentation. Okay, welcome to you all. Um, before we start and from hearing from our panel, I want to take just a minute to frame our discussion. We have all seen that pub the public recognition of the importance of early learning for later success in school and life has become more widespread. As it does, improving the quality of and access to full day kindergarten is often ignored in our discussions, both at the decision-making and at the program planning tables. Yet, it's a key component of creating a strong pre-K through third grade continuum. While studies show that children benefit from full-day kindergarten, making gains in early reading and early math skills, as well as in other areas such as social skills and learning habits, most states do not require districts to provide it. As a result, too many children still do not have access tuition-free, full-day, everyday kindergarten, and for those who do, it's a checkered, highly diverse landscape with a full day ranging anywhere from four to seven hours per day and with levels of quality varying significantly across districts, schools, and classrooms. The full-day kindergarten discussion, however, cannot just be about logging more hours in the classroom. I'm sure you are all keenly aware of the fact that expectations for kindergartners and their teachers have increased dramatically in recent years. And for children in half-day programs, that means having less access to what they will need to meet those expectations. It means less instructional support from teachers, especially in the way children at this age learn best through inquiry-based exploration, hands-on activities, and child-centered play. It means fewer opportunities for developing and practicing important social and what we are now commonly referring to as executive function skills that they will need for future success, such as being able to stay focused, control their behaviors, and solve problems, communicate their own thoughts and feelings, and understand those of others. That kind of learning and development takes time in rich environments with responsive instructional support hard to achieve in a half-day program. So today we will explore what a high-quality, full-day kindergarten classroom experience should include from the perspective of a practicing teacher. We will hear from a district perspective what it takes to identify the right curriculum and intentionally coordinate and connect 
quality teaching and learning across the pre-K through grade three continuum. We will review full day kindergarten policy across the country and we will critically examine what the research tells us about this important issue. With that, I'm going to turn this over to our four panelists, Christy Cowers from the University of Washington, Laura Bronfren from the New America Foundation, Jason Sachs from the Boston Public Schools, and Nina Ballou from Birchwood Elementary School in the Bellingham, Washington School District. Our first speaker is Christy Cowers, who will give us an overview of what the research tells us about full-day kindergarten access and quality. Christy is Research Assistant Professor of P3 Policy and Leadership at the University of Washington and specializes in education reform efforts that address the continuum of learning from birth through third grade. She is Director of the University of Washington's Executive P3 Leadership Institute and is the lead author on the framework for planning, implementing, and evaluating pre-K to third grade approaches, a tool to guide school, district, community, and state efforts. So with that, welcome Christy. Thank you so much, Mimi, and thanks to all of you on the phone. I was asked to give a brief overview of the research related to full day kindergarten. And what I hope to do is even expand our understanding of the different kinds of research that do um, undergird what we think about and know about full day kindergarten. So let me start by just contextualizing why we're talking about full day K in the context of the pre-K through third grade national work group. Many of you know that as we talk about P3 or pre-K through third grade, we talk about the importance of ensuring high quality early learning opportunities or the P part, what children experience before, pre, or prior to school. But we also talk about the importance of full day kindergarten because this is a transition year where kids are moving between the early learning system and the K-12 system. And a P3 approach also includes ensuring that we have really high quality early grades, whereby we can sustain the gains that are made in those preschool and full day K programs. And so when we put all of these pieces together, we have a P3 approach that aligns across the age continuum um, but also ensures that we are providing high quality learning opportunities within each of those age or grade levels. So today we're really focused on that um, pendulum or that uh, fulcrum point between the early learning and K-12 systems with the kindergarten year. So let's uh, dig into what the research says about kindergarten. And as I alluded to when I began, um, I think we tend to take too narrow of a perspective on what research even is. And so I'm going to provide you um, several different perspectives, all research-based, on full-day kindergarten. First, I want to start with what many economists, what, um, what economic research is saying about full-day kindergarten. And what we do know is that full day K provides an employment support for families because basically, whether or not we want to think about kindergarten as child care, that is a function it is serving for families, especially um, many of our low income and at risk families. It is giving them a safe, reliable place for their children to be during extended hours of the day um, while they are at work. Second, we also know from economists that uh, full-day kindergarten contributes to the education production function. Um, this is actually a, um, a, a perspective that has been used for a number of things when we talk about the education production function. What we're really thinking about is a lot of different inputs into education and then figuring out how those affect student learning later. Um, and actually what we know is that there's a lot of things that are put into education that do not lead to greater student learning. For example, teacher degrees. We're increasingly knowing that degree has little impact on student learning. We also know that class size, unless there's dramatic reductions in class size, we know that class size does not have dramatic uh, improvement um, functions on uh, the production function. But one thing that is consistently found to be true is that more instructional minutes 
lead to larger effects on student achievement. And so this has been the argument not just for increased access to pre-K, not just increased access to full day kindergarten, but also things like extended learning opportunities, after school programs, summer programs, extended school days, school years, et cetera. So what we do know is that full day K increases um, the education production function. And then finally, from an economic perspective, we also know that full day K, um, and this is an economic term, term, crowds out other time use activities. So for example, if kids are in full day K, then their participation in full day, day, full day K is crowding them out from doing other things that might not be contributing to their achievement, which could be being in a um, lower quality uh, child care situation. It could be being in no early learning opportunity at all, but being in some sort of family, friend, and neighbor care. So full day K helps to crowd out other negative time use activities that these young children, our five-year-olds, could be engaged in. OK, next I'd like to move towards a different perspective, which is um, what we know pedagogically about full day K. Um, and Mimi mentioned some of this in her introductory remarks. But what we know consistently is that full day K does a lot of good things from a child's actual experience um, within the, inside the classroom. Several are noted here. I won't read all of them, but it, full day K, especially in the standards-based environment in which public education and private education is in right now, full day K gives students a time to focus on more than just reading and math. Full day K permits um, the arts and creativity and physical education and um, a focus on growth and fine motor development and social and emotional skills. Full day K gives more luxury to focus on those things. Um, not just because there's more time, but because teachers feel like they can have a more relaxed instructional pace. Full day K also, again, because of this sort of luxury of time, permits teachers to, um, to tackle um, differentiated instruction in a more meaningful and intentional way. Um, and as you will hear later when Nina, our full day, our practicing full day K teacher presents to you, is that full day K really provides the opportunity to strike that perfect balance between developmentally appropriate play-based learning that is still rigorous and intentional. It, it really helps to find that sweet spot of kid-friendly learning. Um, we also have research that says um, that children in full-day versus half-day classrooms spend more time in child-initiated activities, more time in teacher-directed individual work, less time in large group um, teacher-directed instruction, and these five-year-olds have more time to be reflecting on their own learning. All things that we know are important for our youngest learners. OK, so now I want to move to thinking about um, a different perspective, which is really families' perspective. And there has been some interesting research done on sort of how families perceive and think about full day K. Um, first, we know that families really value full day K because it makes them have to juggle less. They don't have to be stressed out about trying to figure out where their child is going to go after, before or after a half-day program, and they're having to do less jigsawing to make days work for their kids. They know that their children can be in one place um, for an extended period over the day. As I noted earlier, it also decreases the needs for families to identify and not inconsequentially pay for uh, child care. Um, that may or may not be a high-quality learning experience for children. Um, and then we also know that families are actually demanding full day K more because of the big boom in pre-K offerings. Many children are not having kindergarten be their first exposure to um, formal learning, uh, uh, learning settings. Many kids are coming directly from pre-K programs, Head Start programs, um, child care centers, um, places that already have an explicit instructional focus that is still play-based. 
And so families are really wanting to maintain that continuity of experience for their young children. Um, then I want to quickly talk about policy perspectives. And again, another one of our speakers, Laura, will dig a little more deeply into this. But I do think the policy research perspective is important to consider. As I already noted, with the expansion of pre-K um, and children's enrollment and attendance in pre-K, full day K becomes even more important. Um, while I have not yet seen any empirical research, I do know anecdotally from all over the country that what is often happening is that with the expansion of pre-K, we have more and more children in very high quality settings as four-year-olds, but then they have to go into half-day programs uh, in kindergarten. And that is a discontinuity for the child's learning progression. It's a discontinuity, discontinuity for the family, um, and it often becomes a challenge for teachers. So with the expansion of pre-K, we know full-day K is important. As we see kindergarten entry assessments expand all around the country, KEAs, um, full-day kindergarten is really important because it gives more time to do the kinds of whole child assessments that we know are crucial for this age range. Um, we know that teachers are less burdened. Um, if you think about a half-day K teacher having to do a kindergarten entry assessment on two classrooms because she's teaching a half day and an afternoon session, that's a lot of paperwork to do. If, however, a teacher only has to do a single classroom of full-day K kids, it becomes a more doable, manageable task for uh, teachers. And then finally, with Common Core State Standards being adapted, adopted and adapted widely around the country, um, it's really important that we keep in mind the disparities um, that are being created when we have many children still in half-day programs. Those Common Core State Standards set expectations for what all kindergartners should be able to do at the end of the kindergarten year. But what we haven't been as explicit about is that some kids are getting two and a half hours of daily instruction, while others are having as many as six and a half hours of daily instruction to meet those same standards. And then uh, in closing, I want to get to the um, research that I think we most often talk about, which is, well, but how does it impact children? and children's learning outcomes. And um, while some of the research is um, uh, a little equivocal on this, what we do know is that full day K produces positive and rather substantial impacts during the kindergarten year, which means from the beginning of the school year to the end of the school year, full day K kids are outperforming their peers who are in half day programs. And we also know that over the course of the full day K year, achievement gaps are closing um, based on full day K participation, particularly for our low income and non-white children. And let me show you some data that support that. So uh, this is a slide from um, the early childhood longitudinal study, the kindergarten cohort. Um, so this is a federal nationally representative sample of um, students. And what you're looking at here are gains in reading and math achievement, again, from fall to spring. So we're just looking at the kindergarten year right now. And we see almost a third of a standard deviation impact for reading and almost a quarter of a standard deviation for math. And while that looks small-ish, that is actually um, rather substantial. Researchers get pretty excited when there's a standard deviation that crosses over the 0.2 threshold. Um, and so these are meaningful gains for full day K participation. Um, and then I also want to show you some of the achievement gap closing effects. This is, uh, these are data based on actually some of the most exciting um, research happening around full day K right now out of the state of Indiana, where um, they actually have a natural experimental design going on uh, because of some policy choices some districts are getting full day K, others are not, um, but it's a really nice um, experimental design without having to pick and choose which kids get, which, uh, get the full day K intervention or not. And what this shows is the effect size of full day K um, 
based on the total sample of full day K kids in Indiana, but then we're also looking at the effect size for low income kids and then non white kids. And much like the standard deviations you see on this slide, which are sort of aggregate, so 0.32 and 0.22 for math, if we go back here and look at the standard deviation for the total sample, so the bar on the far left, it's about the same. We are seeing full day K is doing good things for all kids. But if you pay attention to the two bars on the right, we're now actually looking at the effect on our more at-risk children. And full day K is having an even greater impact on our low-income kids, and then an even greater impact on our non-white children. Um, where the research becomes a little more equivocal is when we look at the uh, sustainability of those achievement gains into third grade and beyond. And I'm here to argue that those are, um, those are questions that I think should not be asked without considering the full context of a child's education continuum. We need to know the quality of the first grade classroom that children are going into, the quality of the second grade classroom, or the quality of the third grade before we can really start making any um, causal, much less correlational impacts on the effect of full day K uh, later into life. So my key takeaways are that we need to broaden our perspective on what research matters in these debates and conversations. We need to know that it matters to families, teachers, and children. It's really important in helping to make successful many of our current policy reforms. We do know that it is extraordinarily beneficial for kids while they are in the year, and that full day K is going to require a lot of thoughtful design and support. And our next three speakers, I hope, will help to dig even more deeply into that. Thanks very much. Thank you, Christy. That was fabulous. Um, it's just really amazing to hear in such a short a period of time the compelling arguments that you've just given us for why it is so important for full day kindergarten to be available to so many more children than currently have it now. So thank you again. So OK, as we continue, let's take a moment now to respond to the following polling question that you have up on your screen. Um, and while you are responding to that question, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Laura Bromfren, who will talk about what is happening at the policy front across the country. Laura is the deputy director of for early childhood at New America's Early Education Initiative. She examines state and federal policies related to learning and teaching, birth through third. She writes on a variety of topics, including the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, federal education programs, teacher preparation, retention, evaluation, and support, kindergarten, and early childhood assessment. So I think we're really lucky to have her here today, given all the things that she um, is working on every day when she goes to work. Um, her work has been cited in several national and regional publications, including Politico, Education Week, NPR, and the Wall Street Journal. So here are the results of our poll. Great. Most people are making progress. That's terrific. And nobody, or only 3%, said that there is no consideration in their state for full day kindergarten. So that's good news. and. I think what you hear the rest of the presentation will help you to continue to move from not being considered or just starting to, to being up there in that strong category. So Laura, please, please um, go ahead. Thank you, Mimi. Uh, at New America's Early Education Initiative, as Mimi said, you know, we conduct research, develop policy recommendations, and disperse new ideas that aim to improve access, quality, and alignment in early education programs for all children from birth through third grade. And in, you know, over the past couple of years, kindergarten has become a, a particular interest for us, and specifically around children's access to a full day of kindergarten, the quality of that experience, and then how children's learning and development in kindergarten builds on both what came before and then connects to what comes after. And we heard from Christy really why full day kindergarten is so important. And I'll delve a little bit into 
where where we are right now nationally. Um, I'll reiterate a little bit of what um, Christy said and then just offer some some uh, recommendations that we've um, put out before and have for at the federal level and then also for states. So we can move to the next slide. If we, we look nationally, um, and, and this data, these data come from the Children's Defense Fund and the Education Commission of the states, only 11 states plus DC require that school districts offer at least five hours of kindergarten per day at no cost to parents. And the duration of kindergarten of the kindergarten day can actually vary from about two and a half hours to uh, or even two hours to seven hours depending on the state and school district, with some states considering four hours a day to be a full day program. Um, if you look at the second bullet, my slide says that there's five states that have no statute that actually requires districts to offer kindergarten at all. Actually, it's six. Michigan is missing from, from the map there. But th so there's six states that don't require districts at all to offer kindergarten. And while that's the case, many do at least provide a half day. On top of that, several states do not make kindergarten attendance mandatory at all for children. We know that you know, the majority of children do attend kindergarten, but again, it's, it's not required. And at the same time, in many states, go back, I'm still talking on that previous slide, um, the, same, the same time, many states funding for pre-K, as Chrissy mentioned, and investment in pre-K is on the rise, um, and in many cases, states are providing that full day of pre-K learning. Um, you know, getting children ready and, and accustomed to a full day of learning, Head Start often, or in most, in many places, offers that full day. And the federal government, through recent uh, preschool development competi competitions um, for preschool development grants and expansion grants, has really <clears throat> pushed states towards full day pre-K. This is a good thing. It's also a concern when you think about what comes after pre-K. And policymakers, you know, we would say really need to be careful about not setting up situations where it could be possible for children to get a full day of pre-K and then a partial day of learning for kindergarten. These disparities um, really disrupt the pre-K third learning continuum. All right, next slide, please. Before I, I jump in here, I will say that in the past uh, couple of years, some states have moved um, towards providing funding for full-day kindergarten, even if it's not required in statute. So I know that you know Washington, come the state of Washington, come the 2017 and 18 school year, full day is to be provided throughout the state. Oregon is making moves in this direction. Um, Nevada has, over in the last legislative session, put more money towards funding full-day kindergarten for um, dual language learners. And there are other states that are either targeting some of those funds or providing funds, but there's still no requirement um, in statute that all districts offer a full day of kindergarten, which leaves it um, vulnerable or more vulnerable than it might be um, without that, that specific requirement at the state level. And so state definitions of full day and half day uh, often mean you know, very different uh, things across the country and uh, different dosages across the country. And dosage, they're referring to the quantity of time that kindergarten is offered to, to children. There's no standard de de definition. And while there's some variation across states when it comes to first first through 12th grade too, it's not nearly um, at the, the same extent as it is in kindergarten. You wouldn't, you know, have any state saying that, you know, fourth grade is, is voluntary or, you know, ninth grade is voluntary for, for children to attend. I also don't have good numbers on how many children are actually enrolled in kindergarten. You know, based on the, the 2011 census data, Nearly one in four students across the U.S. do not attend full-day kindergarten, but those um, those data are based on you know from census information, and they don't necessarily reflect 
the, the dosage or who pays for it. Uh, is it a publicly funded full day or a parent's paying tuition for part of that day? And then 12 states actually allow school districts to charge for the other half of the day. And this is according to you know, Children's Defense Report. There's tuition, and this may be on a, a, a sliding scale, um, or it could be depending on the, on the district. Um, it, it could be on a, a different rate for children from low-income families or, or not. Um, and, and, you know, kindergarten is really too often ignored. It's not uh, a national priority really like pre-K has become. And again, I'm not saying pre-K shouldn't be getting the attention it is, but instead I'm, th I'm saying that we need to make sure that we're also ensuring children are getting that high-quality kindergarten to follow up the high-quality pre-K. Next slide, please. How does varying kindergarten dosages uh, impact children and families? And first, it's important to note that time does not equal quality, but less time does put children at a disadvantage. I'm going to zoom through some of this on the next slide because uh, Christy ha uh, touched a little bit on, on some of these issues in her presentation. Um, so next slide, please. First. Kindergarten is embedded in the K-12 system, and parents you know, often assume, or you know, when I, I talk to people about the, the differences in kindergarten depending on, on the state when we're talking time, um, there's a lot of assumptions there that, that there's not as much variation as there is. Um, but you know, in fact, the instructional hours aren't the same, and the funding isn't at the same level. Children attending kindergarten for less than five hours a day do receive less and sometimes much less instructional time and time for um, you know what we, what we know um, time for instruction in ways that we know young children learn best. Christy mentioned the the you know Common Core state standards, which the the rigor of Common Core or other college and career ready standards um, they require a little bit more attention and. The, the half day sets up children to not really get what they what they need. And when we have, in some states, children receiving as little as two hours per day of instruction, and we know a lot of that time will go to transition and, and other things, as Christy said, it really limits teachers to what they, they feel that they're able to do. Common Core Standards you know, were designed on the DA assumption that kindergartners had a full day of learning and all had equal amounts of, of equal time throughout the day. But that half-day kindergarten really allows less time for teachers to teach in, um, you know, through inquiry-led instruction, allow opportunities for child-centered play and exploration and hands-on activities, all of those important learning opportunities. Um, kindergartners have less time to be with teachers who know how to help them develop and practice social emotional skills and manage their emotions and regulate their behaviors, all of those things that we know are important for um, their development but also for their success in later grades. And while the Common Core really only directs what should be taught in math and reading and not how it should be taught, as you know, Christy noted, teachers may feel that they, they're restricted, they don't have flexibility to really focus on um, other subject areas, other learning and employ strategies that really match how young children learn best. And so if we want our children to be college and career ready and we want to prevent um, some of that, that early learning and full day kindergarten from you know, fading out in later grades, we need to ensure that kindergarten is a strong experience and it's also followed up by a strong first grade and second grade. Um, and finally, I just want to note that the other challenge is one that um, was previously pointed out that for families, when states allow districts to, or when states don't provide full day kindergarten or they allow districts to charge for it, it's, you know, a, a, ch a huge challenge for families. It's either, you know, denying them, them access and it's making employment and um, child care uh, issues more challenging for families. Next slide. So just to, to reiterate, we heard 
about a, a new way of looking at research through several perspectives, economic, pedagogical, through families, policy, and education outcomes. I just want to reiterate that, you know, first, brain and developmental science increasingly shows the importance of the early years and of children's earliest learning experiences. We've seen some large um, studies or reviews of research that have shown that the longer kindergarten days um, in high quality programs lead to positive outcomes for children. And um, 2008, a literature review found associations between full day kindergarten and higher reading levels. And Christy certainly pointed out some several other um, benefits and, and positive findings in research. So just to, to close here, a couple of um, things that we've talked about in the past and, and how to make um, get a better picture of what children are receiving when it comes to kindergarten. We, we talk about dosage. Um, to go ahead, next slide. So first, it's really important that um, we, we get the states to, to have a requirement that, that districts offer full day kindergarten at no charge to parents. That's equivalent to a first grade. Um, so that all children have the benefits of a, a comprehensive kindergarten experience. Second, education educators, policymakers, data gatherers should really, we think, abandon this language of full day and half day um, and instead measure quantity by hours per week and year so we can really get the a, a good idea and a better picture of the kind of kindergarten experiences, again, when it comes to that, that time frame that, that children are receiving. And then also we'd say that, you know, any school districts and states that receive public money should be required to report publicly and to the federal government the number of hours per week and hours per year that children have the opportunity to attend kindergarten. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. That was fabulous, of course. And um, I, I really appreciate the fact that you've raised so many important and very basic issues around um, creating full-day kindergarten programs and the kinds of information that we really need to have at our fingertips as we share um, this, this kind of this work with, with policymakers in our states who are interested in, in creating good programs, that they address some of these very important issues that you've raised today. So before we move on, just one quick reminder to all of you that it, please use the chat box um, to the right to uh, enter any questions that you have, and we will definitely get to those at the end of our session. And then let's take a look at this next quick poll, polling question. Please take a minute to answer this, and I will move ahead and introduce our next speaker to you while you're doing that. Um, he is Jason Sachs who will share his story of how one district is working to provide high quality full day kindergarten that meets the needs of its students and also creates a strong continuum of quality across the entire P3 spectrum. He is the Director of Early Childhood at the Boston Public Schools where he has overseen the expansion of kindergarten classes and coordinates kindergarten and early childhood programs for the district. This includes the successful implementation of the kindergarten curriculum, professional development system for teachers and principals, expansion of NAEYC accredited classrooms in Boston, and a comprehensive evaluation system of both classroom quality and child outcome. So have we got a, a ah, good, here's the results of our poll. Um, great. Good to see there's beginning to be some alignment across, and um, I'm sure we're going to hear from Jason in just a few minutes how we can move the needle on making that alignment across um, grades and programs much more um, realistic than it is now in many of your states and districts. So with that, Jason, welcome. Thanks. Uh, from snowy Boston. Um, all right, so listening to the first two presenters, it strikes me that uh, Boston is uh, wherever you guys are, maybe 20 years forward from now, maybe 10 years forward from now. Um, so I'll share some experiences of what we've gone through um, in hopes that maybe it'll shortcut your learning curve. Um, 
uh, as a district in the 90s, like mid-1990s, we had uh, half-day preschool programs, which we call K-1, and we actually cut them in the mid-90s so that we as a district, ahead of the state, um, could go to full-day kindergarten, and then the state actually started funding full-day planning uh, grants, and they match uh, if you spend more money, uh, if you pay a paraprofessional in the classroom, at least a half-time in the classroom, then the state will give you money, and um, so we now have full-day kindergarten. Um, and then in uh, 2005, you can go to the next slide, um, the mayor basically said, well, we should now go back. Now that we have full-day kindergarten, we should implement full-day preschool. So in 2005, we implemented in the district, and this is just public school classrooms only, a full-day preschool program for about half the kids that would go to kindergarten. So it's about 2,000 children in almost every elementary school. And that's what we call K-1 classrooms. And interestingly, the teachers wanted to be called K-1 teachers so instead of preschool teachers so that they could stay on the same union scale as the kindergarten system. So that's it's useful for you to think through. Um, we implemented the full-day preschool program in 2005. We've now had uh, extensive reviews of it, and the K-1 or the preschool experience is having a tremendous amount of uh, effect size on student outcomes, and so Christy had mentioned that 8.2 effect size is effective. You can see the Boston Public Schools on vocabulary. We have an effect size of 0.45, letter word identification 0.62, applied problems, which is math. So we're sort of off the charts as far as if you offer a high quality preschool experience, you will get a lot of um, outcomes. Um, and it should be noted that about 70% of our kids were already in preschool programs in Boston before. Um, and so this, the, this is, even if they were in a preschool program or a Head Start, these are the effects you would see compared to kids who, had, um, who just go to our K-1. So um, it's important to know that this K-1 is sort of, sort of what made the difference. Okay, next slide. Um, and now I'm just going to whip through these, but this shows basically that the impact of the K-1, the preschool programs, lasted all the way to third grade. Um, on these are our state tests, um, and these are literacy. Math is similar. Um, but you can see, you know, depending on free and reduced lunch or all students or Asian, black, Hispanic, white, the, the differences last all the way to third grade, though we did see some uh, fade. Next slide. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. And this just shows the black-white difference in third grade MCAS scores. You're seeing still a 30 percent uh, difference between kids who go through the K-1 experience in the public schools versus those that do not. Next slide, please. Um, and then starting to look, um, okay, so you implemented it, you spent all this money on coaching, now you don't spend all this money in coaching, does the K-1 still have the same effect? And the answer seems to be yes. Um, and again, for ethnicity, it doesn't matter what ethnic group, it, the K-1 experience is really helping, and in free and reduced lunch, the same thing. Next slide, uh, please. Um, okay, so we, we uh, spent so much time working on K-1 um, that... Uh, the kids started asking a lot of really good questions and wanting to do a lot more in the classroom, and then we started looking more and more at kindergarten classrooms, and we thought, wow, they're not really super strong quality. And we sort of knew it in the, in the back of our mind, but we didn't really know how to approach it. And um, our K-1 expansion was sort of based on um, on two sort of fundamental beliefs. One is you, what, what the teacher is teaching. Um, and who the teacher is makes a huge difference. Um, but also it's a combination sort of of curriculum and the professional development and supports that teachers get. And so taking that sort of mantra, we, we wanted to say, okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll do a kindergarten curriculum. Um, and we'll, do, we'll find a strong one that's out there. Um, and we'll do professional development and we'll, we'll roll it out. Um, unfortunately, the district was then implementing a K-5 to reading curriculum. Um, and it wasn't very strong in early childhood, and we pointed all that out, but, um, you know, because the district was so focused on sort of a comprehensive K-5 to reading approach or a literacy approach, um, they didn't really worry about the early childhood department saying this is not the most uh, best way to teach kids and we don't think it's that strong curriculum. Um, but what we did, so they wouldn't allow us to write our own curriculum or implement a curriculum in kindergarten, and so what we... Um, did is we moved to NAEYC accreditation because that at least got us into um, cl kindergarten classrooms and uh, allowed us to do coaching around the standards of NAEYC accreditation. And what we found is that NAEYC accreditation really improved the evaluation scores of 
the quality of instruction on the class and the echoes. So we knew that the accreditation scores were at least affecting the improvement of what kindergarten instruction looked like. But we still hadn't gotten into the curriculum. So uh, fast forward to uh, 2012 when the reading curriculum, the K through 5 reading curriculum in the district was sort of rejected um, as not being that strong and that our third grade scores were still relatively low. And so uh, we seized the opportunity to say, okay, we, we've been trying to do a kindergarten curriculum. And so it's called Focus on K2. Um, and so we uh, first, you know, doing a national search, didn't really find a kindergarten curriculum that we thought um, was as strong as what we wanted. Um, and so we created our own curriculum. And so on our website, and everything I'm referring to is something I'll focus on K2. And, I, and I'm going to walk you through it, not because I think you should do our curriculum, but I'm going I'm to show you sort of the language we use to argue for a developmentally appropriate curriculum. And I think it's just helpful um, from, from our perspective just to share what we've learned, and hopefully it will be useful. Um, OK, <clears throat> so first we said you know, our pre-K experience was super, uh, uh, super effective, let us do K2. Um, because we're seeing that there is some fade out effect and then we actually did the class and the ELCO and some other measures of the quality of instruction in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and third grade and really found that the quality of instruction is pretty low and so we're saying let us get into the classrooms by using the curriculum but we really hope to move the dial of quality of instruction through coaching, mentoring, professional development, etc. Um, and, uh, and Again, in 2012, we, we did an extensive review of all the kindergarten curriculum out there, and we didn't find them, uh, the ones that we liked. We didn't think they were strong enough in vocabulary. They didn't have some of the um, sort of regio principles that we really were supportive of. They didn't really integrate across uh, science, math, et cetera, so we created our own. Um, and uh, what was shocking was, so we said, who wants to volunteer? And in Boston, to get anybody to volunteer uh, is pretty hard. And what we had, uh, we thought we would get like maybe 30 classrooms. We ended up 50 schools volunteered uh, immediately because of the effect of the K-1. So we piloted with 50 schools, which is a really bad idea. But we did it anyways because we wanted the momentum. And now uh, we are rolling it out this year to the entire district. So we are in 80 schools. So that's our focus on K-2 experience. Next slide. Um, so um, understanding focus on K2, and for those of you who know Reggio Emilia, uh, then you, you can kind of get a sense of we're really following children are reading the dance. The teachers are sort of following the lead of the students. But there's a lot of thinking and planning that goes on behind the scenes um, to, to help children understand uh, what, what they're thinking about and building a collective group intelligence. OK, so the next slide, please. Um, so this is a big shift because kindergarten teachers, even though they are, as Christy and Laura have already pointed out, when, they're in a, when it's a good experience and it's full day, they do allow children more time to think and process and, and work in centers or play in centers. Um, there's still a lot of tight control uh, in kindergarten classrooms. There's still a lot of, well, we need to teach some basic skills. You know, this is where they're learning academics. And even though I have a wide swath of kids, some kids who've had a lot of preschool, I've also had kids who have nothing, and, you know, have no experience, and we need to get them to write or hold a pencil or whatever, you know, the worry is that they're not going to succeed. Um, and so it, it really took us a, a fair amount of time to get the teachers to see the shift that trust in your children. You don't need to control everything. You give them the the center structures and interesting and engaging material, and they will succeed. So it was a change in thinking. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so again, as I mentioned, uh, there was a change in thinking, but not only um, as in the kid doing the work, but then the students sharing their work with one another, and then the whole class collectively learning. Um, and so I think what's a little bit different is it's not about just an individual child, but there's actually a whole thinking, feeling, and feedback protocol that the class learns from and then students go back into their own groups. Um, and again, there's a lot of room for children's interests and strengths, but it's across themes. So the next slide. Um, Great. Oh, so this is how you sell it. I think um, a lot of, you know, when you're in a public school environment, it's a lot about standards and the common core. Um, and so these were uh, sort of the way we, we structured it. NAYC gives you your, your standards for national appropriate, I mean, developmentally appropriate practices, relationship standards, sets, sort of sets the table for good practice. 
Um, and the Common Core uh, is very clear uh, in, in how you're supposed to read like a detective and how you're supposed to really stay on text, and there's a lot of nonfiction. The Common Core, however, is really text dependent, and so for early childhood, we really kind of are creating the argument that it's about children need to do and experience and talk about. Um, because some of the texts are actually not as complex as we want. We want them to be doing deeper stuff, but if you just leave it to text, it doesn't always get to the complexity of students' thinking. Um, then we also really leaned on the 21st century skills because these are skills that you need to be successful and that's creativity, collaboration, communication, and critical thinking and all of those are really emphasized um, in our curriculum and sort of our buzz phrase we've been talking about is this knowledge building. Students need to be knowledge builders. Um, and then from the outcome measures that later on Christy or others will cite, it will be around self-regulation, vocabulary, math. Um, the other thing I wanted to add is two outcomes that we really think about. One is in the classroom, these culminating projects. So we have capstone projects. For example, the mayor of Boston sends a letter to every kindergarten classroom that basically says, "What I would like to make my city a fairer city. Um, what do you think fair? Uh, what would a fair space look like or a fair, fairer building look like? And so that's kind of an interesting project for kids. And then the last project is about the school sustainability and recycling. Uh, so you see a lot of school projects. And so that's about democratic participation. So we're really trying to teach citizenship in, in our schools and what it means to be a citizen in Boston. Okay, so the next slide. Um, it's, it, the curriculum itself is around four themes, our community, construction, oh no, I'm sorry, our community, the animals and habitats, um, and, uh, and the animals and habitats really focus on a couple animals, but there's a lot of research literature behind it, and then uh, construction, and then our earth, and the capstone projects come in construction in our earth. Next slide. Um, okay, and so what does a curriculum really mean? For us, it means a two-hour block in a day. Math is still discrete, but we'd like it to get integrated over time. Um, but it's really, this is what we're talking about. It's 20 minutes of whole group meeting um, where there's just all sort of some of the social emotional stuff, some of the introduction of the centers. Um, then it's actual deep centers where the, where the teacher doesn't stay in one place. There is a time where the teacher does do some skill building activities, foundations, or whatever. So that could be one part, but then they, we really are encouraging them to get up, move around, explore centers, document students' work, really engage with students in a very meaningful way, also do their um, documentation documentation and, and work sampling or, or whatever they're doing. Um, and then they come back and they do this thinking and feeding protocol, uh, protocol. There might be some read-alouts and then the sharing of the research. So it's really kind of this flowing process that happens. And that's a lot of time to get in a full day program and not everybody's doing it and we're all, you know, we'll talk about that. Next slide. Um, Okay, I, I'm just going to skip this, but basically we, we had an intentional design for English language learners and um, special education using universal design and that, so if people have questions later on, we can talk about that next. Um, okay, the, the other important piece, as I mentioned, is not just the curriculum, it's sort of how do you build a supportive network in school districts. So what we've done is every teacher will go through a monthly seminar, but we have an additional monthly seminar for one lead teacher in each school. And they're really using, in Boston, we have something called Common Planning Time, which is a weekly uh, grade team planning. And so we're really working with the lead teacher at scale so that they can um, facilitate their team. And um, there's a lot of democratic buildings, uh, a lot of sharing and feedback. Almost the same principles we're using for the kindergarten um, curriculum for the students to do. We have teachers do it with one another. And again, these were lessons we learned from the preschool experience, but it's really building sort of a Reggio-esque uh, documentation pedagogical viewpoint. Uh, and it really trusts not only the students, but trusts the teachers to do their work professionally. And it does require, it's like we're not dumbing down the curriculum for the teacher. We're actually expecting our teachers to be master teachers and really building an infrastructure to support that. Because frankly, that's the only way to teach well. And um, I know Christy said that degrees, there's research says degrees don't matter, but I just find that really disappointing um, because it's going to take a lot to do this well. And we really expect our teachers, uh, and, and our OI teachers have master's degrees within five years of higher. So, um, okay, next one. Um, Okay, so here's been the challenges to our implementation. Next slide. 
Um, the, the teacher change in their pedagogical practice. Teachers like to be in control of kids. It's very hard for them to, t uh, to trust their kids. Um, and so that's been a real hard one. Also, the principal really expects to see students doing certain things. And um, you know, they're always like, whether they're doing a dramatic play. And so we really are doing a lot of work um, uh, to, to really get teachers to articulate uh, what students are doing and produce strong work and be able to demonstrate strong work. Um, the good news is that everybody's beginning to see that there's a much higher level of student engagement. They're doing amazing things. I, I can't tell you every time I walk into a classroom now, a teacher just smiles and says, you know, I didn't know my kids could do this. This is amazing. Um, uh, so that's been good. And to change teacher expectations of what children can do is critical. Um, so far, you know, we've only been implementing this for one year in the 50 classrooms, but we looked at the Dibbles data, which is this dynamic indicator of reading literacy skills, which is like how, the skills you need for reading. Um, and what we found so far is that there's been no change, no difference in the Dibble scores, meaning that even though teachers weren't doing all this skills-based stuff, thus far we've seen no significant difference, or it didn't hurt kids. Um, for kids who had no pre-K experience, um, we are seeing that there's an increase in vocabulary, which is great. So this is obviously getting them to talk more. Uh, for those who get, had K-1 experience already, this is not hurting or harming or helping at this moment their vocabulary is great. But again, we're only in year one of the implementation. Um, next slide. Uh, lessons learned. Uh, Teachers experienced a huge disequilibrium before success. It took until about January for teachers to get the routines and really trust in the kids. Uh, ongoing professional development systems, you can't do this if you don't have coaching and uh, you know, common planning time and really some inspirational leaders to do this work. Um, the development of teacher leaders is critical to do this at scale because uh, for pre-K we had a lot more money than we did for, a uh, for a kindergarten. Uh, teacher collaboration is highly valuable and requires dedicated meeting time, so principals really have to free up and value teacher times meeting with each other, and they have to not control those meetings, but again, trust in their teachers. Uh, inclusion of paraprofessionals, we have half-time paraprofessionals, so we, they are not taken advantage of as much, and so we need to really work, and they are super enthusiastic. It's usually this kind of weird power dynamic, and so really kind of teaming them up has been huge. Um, and then the administration commitment determines the extent to which, it, which the teacher can implement the curriculum with fidelity. So the principals play a key role in doing this well. Uh, next slide. Um, so now uh, we've got kids flying out of K-1 and they're going into K-2 and now they're going into first and second grade. Um, and so we are now working with Noni Guasso at Harvard to really think through what a first and second grade and potentially a third grade curriculum would need to look like. That is both developmentally appropriate but really kind of ups the ante for um, the literacy skills that are needed for reading. Because uh, it's great that they're interested, it's great they're engaging, but there's, there's certain like level readers and cortex and uh, things that students really need explicit teaching on and or the uh, undermining supports. And so, um, you know, sort of upping the ante and, and thinking about developmentally appropriate, but really focusing deeply on the skills you need for reading. So we're, we're working on that. Um, and then just really kind of working with other departments because, you know, science, math, uh, social studies, they all have limited time and we need to get them to realize that if we create an integrated curriculum, they're actually going to get more time other than less time um, because the teacher can make the connections and the kids are making the connections. But to really do that is going to take a collective intelligence and so we're working on that. Um, the other piece is it's easy to say early childhood and maybe you get preschool and maybe you get kindergarten, but there is no first through third grade early childhood people. They now see themselves as deep into elementary school and so how do you build sort of a first, second, and third grade identity in your school and maybe we call it early elementary, I don't know, but really thinking about that. Um, but I would just sort of finish with saying the good news is the folks around here really see the event, you know, the students are super engaged, they see teachers engaged, they see the students work uh, is phenomenal. Um, and so, and we know that the data that I showed you in the beginning is really making a difference. So I think we have an opportunity here to create uh, something um, where people are willing to do the work in an urban setting with 70% of our kids are low income, um, but our teachers are highly skilled. So I think I'll just stop there and wait if, if it was useful for questions. I think I'm done. Thanks, Jason. Thank you very much. And please, again, uh, just a quick little reminder, if you have any questions for Jason or any of the other speakers coming up, um, write those in, your, in the chat box. Um, 
I think, Jason, what you've given us is a very realistic yet ambitious picture of what a district can do to offer high quality pre-K and some of the some of the issues that um, will arise as people think about creating more of a, a, a stronger continuum across the, the um, K123 continuum. So here's our next polling question. Um, take a look at that and take a few minutes to answer it. And while you're doing that, I would like to introduce you to our next speaker, Nina Ballou, who is a full day kindergarten teacher in the Bellingham School District in Bellingham, Washington. She was part of the pilot training in Bellingham as they transitioned from half day to full day kindergarten in 2010. She's also part of the district's kindergarten steering committee as well as a demonstration classroom in the district. Nina has worked with Christy and with the Gates Foundation serving on the Brain Trust to help the state make some transitions from, high, from half day to full day kindergarten. She currently teaches at the Birchwood Elementary School. So let's take a look at our results of our poll and rate. Teachers are getting some specialized training. That's, that's good to see. Um, and we just heard how important professional development is from Jason and I. We may hear some more about that from Nina as we move forward. So Nina, welcome. And please tell us about your life as a full day kindergarten teacher. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, my role here is to really just give you some practical teacher application tips um, or ideas as you move forward um, with the implementation of full day to ensure a high quality classroom. So next slide, please. I'm going to take you on my journey um, when I sit down in really July now, <laughs> but August, um, about what I think about as far as um, the setup of my classroom and the curriculum that I'm going to be implementing. So on this slide, you see this graph where I think about the first part of my year, the first nine weeks of school, more like preschool. And um, thinking about the intention and the intentional and the meaningful play that's happening in my classroom. And everything that I'm doing in my classroom is really based on um, developmentally appropriate practices. And luckily, in my district, I have two preschools just in my school, but we have a really tight alignment with our pre-K partners, and so I'm able to really know where my kids are coming from, and also, clearly, I'm in an elementary school, so I have access to my first and second grade and third grade teachers, so I know where they're going. And so I really focus on the first nine weeks as preschool, and then I have my, I implement what really looks like kindergarten, and then my last nine weeks is um, really looking more like first grade. So giving you a practical example of this is maybe at the beginning of kindergarten, my kids are working on the letter sound P. Well, they're going to take an object out of a box at their table, and they're going to roll out the letter P in Play-Doh. But then later, they might be writing the first sound in pencil. And then later, they might be learning about animals and actually writing drawing a picture and labeling it. And so just seeing that continuum where it's going from the intentional meaningful play and transitioning through the year to the academic side and looking more like first grade. Next slide, please. And so then the second part that I think about um, when I sit down is thinking about the physical environment and really knowing and truly understanding that the classroom really acts as the second teacher and that the room arrangement that I have in my classroom is really critical to the development of the child. Um, and in my district, fortunately, I'm very fortunate to have an early childhood coordinator and a superintendent and a principal who all align the same beliefs that kids need materials that are developmentally appropriate to grow and learn, and that I can use those materials to create dynamic learning spaces for my kids. Um, so I'm going to walk you through my classroom to just give you um, a visual and an example of um, what this looks like. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So this is my classroom this year. Um, this is our whole group circle area. I know that the demands of um, Common Core, like Jason was saying, are very text heavy and text dependent, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to sacrifice developmentally appropriate practices. We come to our whole group meeting and we have morning meeting and we sing songs, but we also engage in shared reading and interactive writing and all of the appropriate strategies that I know that I need to do in order to ensure a high quality learning environment for my children and a high quality curriculum. Next slide, please. 
Um, this is the back of my classroom, and you can start to see um, little areas forming for kids who need different places to learn. You might notice that I don't have any um, name tags on my or labels on my tables because I teach children very intentionally that they can choose anywhere that they'd like to work as long as they're learning. And it's a bummer if I have to manage you, right? So you can start to see my small group table. That's where I pull small groups, but it's also a place for children to learn. And my classroom is there at the very beginning of the year, and we build it up together based on our learning. So this was back in December when we were learning our letter names and sounds. Next slide, please. This is our home area, our dramatic play area. And like I said, my district is really um, very passionate about having all of our classrooms look the same and, and ensuring that we have the materials to do so. So this is um, where kids can learn and grow and practice um, their oral ling language skills and play and they're pretending and um, they're, they're doing most of their learning, I would say, during playtime. And this is one of the areas in which they play. You can see the puppet theater on the left side, the TP on the right. Next slide, please. And yes, that is a closet bathtub. My kids read in there. Um, sometimes they take a clipboard and write. But you can start to see um, these more dynamic spaces that are um, starting to emerge in my classroom. And I just want to make sure that I have unique places for my kids to learn and grow and so that I'm responding to their needs um, as they grow and learn. Next slide, please. This is our block area. Underneath that train table, I have blocks and Legos. Um, and all of my kids visit this area on a daily basis, um, practicing their math skills and their science skills and um, building lots of things. And they pull those, those tables out um, or those rolling bins out onto the carpet. And they make these huge structures that go across the room. Um, and as you can see here, that there's labels on everything. So my kids and I labeled the whole classroom at the beginning of the year so they know where everything is and they can take ownership um, over the materials. And that really fosters a sense of independence. Next slide, please. So this is just a look at um, a typical daily schedule that I have in my kindergarten classroom. Um, there's a whole balance of whole group, small group, and one-on-one -on -one instruction with um, time embedded for a lot of reflection. But if you scroll your eyes down to where the 11.35 time is, you'll see work time. And that's what, in our district, is um, our plan do review model. And what kids do here is they plan what they're going to do. They play for anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes. Um, and then we come back together and we share and we review and we re re reflect on the learning that has happened during that time. Um, as you can see in this entire day, it's just one portion of our day, but it's a large, large portion because what I know about developmentally appropriate practice is that kids need time to learn and manipulate materials and talk to each other. And that's really going to help their problem solving skills and develop their social emotional skills as well as their oral language skills. This is also a time where I do most of my observational assessments because what is what the best thing about play is is that it's just the most authentic time to catch kids in what they really know and what they know how to use. So next slide, please. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about play and the critical components that I believe, um, my district believes. You can walk into any of our kindergarten classrooms across the district and see this. Um, but the critical components, really, is this first part of kids planning. They're practicing their oral language skills. They are, sometimes I have my kids plan together with the group that they're going to play with so that it deepens the, pl the level of play. And then they're talking to each other. And I truly believe that kindergarten should be loud and buzzing because they're just fostering their oral language skills. And we know that um, oral language skills are the reading is a reading predictor, a reading achievement predictor. Um, so they are creating a plan. And it's going to deepen their play as they move on if they have a plan. Um, and then it's just the right length of time. Over the course of the year, it, it changes. At the beginning of the year, it might not be so long because they can't sustain. Um, the stamina isn't there. They can't sustain for that long. And, and, and a teacher will know when the play is starting to disintegrate. And they, and, that teacher needs to bring them back together. Um, but as the year goes on and their problem-solving skills get 
um, better and um, they grow as, as learners, but the play can just continue on and can last a little bit longer. Next slide, please. So something um, that is really critical to play is having hands-on activities. And they're not, I'm not setting up the activities, but I'm setting, I'm setting up the materials for them to engage in. So I have the home area, but the home area morphs and changes. Sometimes they um, want to play restaurant, and so I will bring out menus from home, and we'll bring out a little bit more food that I might have in my closet. And it morphs and changes how, as kids, change their, their level of play. Um, just, just a few months ago it was a pet shop and so we brought out all of the stuffed animals and the masks and, and all of these materials for the kids to really dive deeper into the play and this just promotes you know, social emotional skills, it, it promotes fine motor development, it promotes oral language development and so all of these things are these, are these true skills that are going to build um, functional children in the classroom and and this is the most important time of my day it's sacred and I never change it because this time will feed into the literacy time of my day and the math time of my day because they're building these foundational skills as learners um, the next really critical part to the play is um, children needing to have the basic rules and boundaries but in my classroom it's only um, be respectful, make good decisions, and solve problems. And really with those three rules or um, boundaries, it's, it's really all encompassing of the things that you're going to um, find with children when they're playing. Usually they're so deep in the play, not many things happen that need me, but um, sometimes they do and those three, things, those three rules really help. Um, and then my role is also really critical. I heard not too long ago that I should just stand back and watch them, but what I know about what I know is true about developmentally appropriate practices is children need to be pushed and they need to sometimes be held back a little bit, but it's always very intentional, all the teaching points that I have for my students during this time. And I need to be be an active observer, but also sometimes step back and let the children do what they need to do. Um, but it also, again, is my time to take those observational assessments for my um, whole child assessment. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you so much. Um, so this is just kind of what I've already talked about. Um, my observations and interactions, like this slide says, support, extend, and enrich the learning. So um, during Halloween, I had pumpkins out and just a, an array of measuring tools. And they went over and they explored that area. Um, this is a little girl who's retelling the very hungry caterpillar during work time. So I am observing her doing this. and, and getting all of my literacy objectives that I needed for my assessment. So it was pretty cool to see that. Next slide, please. Um, the last few things I'm going to talk about is just this idea of choice and ownership. Jason talked a lot about um, it's hard for teachers to trust their students. And I think that can be really, it can be a true statement for sure. And for me, how I go about that is I have bottom lines. I need my kids to be reading during independent reading time but they can read any just right book and they can read anywhere. It's really thinking about what's the appropriate choice for the child um, and making intentional teaching choices based on what's appropriate. And when you have bottom lines as a teacher, the child's really owning their choices. Um, and then th the power struggle sometimes or that trust that um, Jason was talking about is just it becomes a non-issue. Um, so, and we create these posters together and they change throughout the year. Um, the kids decide what their literacy choices are and I'm okay with that because they're making an awesome choice and as, and as I said, the choices change based on what's appropriate for them at that time in the year and if you think all the way back to that beginning slide, that transitional slide from preschool, um, my first nine weeks looking like preschool into kindergarten and then to first grade, that's how these posters morph and change and that's how um, their choices are going to change. But it's all about having that bottom line and, and, and really being clear about that expectation. Next slide, please. 
So this is Hobe. This is one of my students, and he, um, you know, like any other teacher in any other school in the entire country, I've got my tough ones too. And um, it was really about me trusting him to, um, to develop as he needed to. And so at the beginning of the year, his day looked a lot different than a lot of my other students. But here he is during work time, during that play time. Um, and because I had very intentional um, teaching points for him throughout the year, especially based on his behavior, so he could function appropriately in the classroom, he is now, he, he said he wanted to paint a Valentine's Day poster for his grandpa. He went and got the, he had to get a chair to get the paint. He got the paint out. He got the brushes out. And what you don't really see in this, um, these pictures is him working and sharing the materials with three other kids during that time. And so I think my main point here with being intentional is um, it's not about it's not about having the increased amounts of minutes to make a half day from a full day. It's what we do with those minutes in that full day because now, like Christy said, we have that luxury of a full day, but it's what we really do and it's how intentional we are about how we teach kids and what is developmentally appropriate for our children. And like Jason was saying, with his developmentally appropriate curriculum that we created, um, or they created, excuse me, you know, the kids really do bring the curriculum. I have kids who don't have any early learning experiences like Hope, and it's my job as a kindergarten teacher to not only close the achievement gap, like Christy said, but also close that opportunity gap, to close the opportunity gap that children like Hope, who don't have the opportunity um, to go to early learning, have early learning experiences, and to make sure that I'm meeting their needs intentionally so that they are successful through first grade and second grade and beyond. So um, I thank you for this time to talk to you as a teacher. And if you have any questions, please write them down in the box um, to the right of your screen. Thanks so much. Nina, thank you so much. That was um, a wonderful presentation. And what a great way to end this discussion with an in-depth look at what full day kindergarten looks like up close in your classroom. You've really given us a sense of what it takes consistently deliver high quality experiences for children. Thank you again. It's been great. I'm going to put up one more polling question quickly. And um, while you are answering that, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank all our speakers for their thoughtful and I think each of you has food for thought as well as concrete examples of what it will take at all levels to ensure children have access that are of the highest quality and experience and support that our children need. So thank you again. It's been a very interesting. So um, we're going to move to questions and answers next. Uh, let's take a quick look and see what the response is. Um, yes, funding is usually the biggest biggest hurdle and hopefully we heard some very compelling arguments today that you can take your policy makers to convince them that indeed making an investment in full day kindergarten is well worth it in so many different ways. So thank you for that. All right, let's move to questions and answers, please. Um, I have one quick beginning question that I would like to ask the entire group. So any of you that want to respond, please do. Um, and here it is. Without such a strong, comprehensive district system like the one in Boston, is what do you, all of you think is the most important entry point or starting place for moving toward high quality kindergarten at the classroom level? Mimi, this is Christy. Before others answer, your sound is coming in and out. Can you make sure you're sitting? Sitting still and staying close to the computer, please. I'm sitting as still as I possibly can, and I'm okay, sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, thank you for letting me know. That That's helpful. I actually have it on conference, so I'm going to flip that off so that I'm talking directly into the phone. Maybe that will help. So would you like me to read the question again so that um, people can understand it? Yes, please. OK. So without such a strong, comprehensive district system like the one that Boston is providing, 
what is the most important entry point or starting place for moving toward high quality kindergarten at the classroom level? If I could take a stab at that, Mimi, it's Nina. Thank you. That's great. Thanks. Um, what I think made the biggest difference in Bellingham is having an early childhood education coordinator. There was a classroom teacher, um, a veteran classroom teacher that really knew developmentally appropriate practice that stepped up to the district level in that role. Um, and and that she was the voice, and she has a direct connection to our superintendent. And so she was our voice for our entire grade level and really started to make those changes and demand that early childhood um, was a big presence in our district and that we needed to make those clear connections so that kids could have, um, you know, could it, it was equitable, basically, um, across our, our district and our system, K-12. So having that point person was really critical to um, the development of our program. Great, thank you. You know, and that brings up another question that I think a lot of people are wondering about, and that um, this is probably, again, something that any or all of you could, could answer, and that has to do, again, with this whole issue of leadership. And um, can any of you talk about the role that you see principals in particular playing in terms of helping full day kindergarten to really be a successful program in a school? Sure, this is Christy. I'm happy to answer that. We, we have found that principals are key to this because you can have really phenomenal classroom teachers like Nina, but they, if they are working in a context where early learning is neither understood nor supported, then their efforts are really going to be thwarted. And so we actually, uh, here in Washington State and around the country are um, taking on a big push to help bring school-based principals, both principals and assistant principals, along in not only understanding full day K in and of itself, but understanding how full day K fits in this early learning continuum and how high quality full day K is going to require that first grade teacher practices change, which will then make push second grade teacher practices to change. And so we have long seen principals as really being central to this. And I would argue that sort of the national um, obsession with principal preparation right now um, is evident that other people are thinking about this a lot, too. Thank you. That's great. Well, I see that we're uh, almost. Uh, oh, go ahead, Jason. I'm sorry. I'm, OK. Um, well, I would just add that um, I think a lot of this has to do with sort of the way we are messaging our work. I think that. You know, the, the public school was designed on an agrarian day, and it was designed, and it is designed mostly in a way for older kids. And it is not, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of science about how young children learn. And I think um, what we have to do is, is to say, we actually want to get to be in a place where we are more rigorous than the principal wants. Um, I think that, that most people are acting out of a place of, well, if I see them writing or if I see them doing their alphabet or if I see them sitting at a desk, then I know I'm preparing them better. And I think what, we've, what we, are, we are slowly building is sort of the science says, no, actually, young children learn different, and you need to do it this way in order to be more appropriate. Um, and so I think the way we message and do the work with principals is really critical because um, I find that the principal you know, can obviously help with time and, and setting the leadership, but they're not really the instructional leader. But they certainly can get in the way of strong developmentally appropriate practice. So I think um, it's really important for them to come to a basic understanding of what good, rigorous early childhood work looks like and what good, rigorous early childhood teaching looks like. And then they will sort of back off and let the teachers do their work. It's generally that it's coming from a place of not understanding that if you do it this way, you will get stronger outcomes. Mm -hmm. So it's just making the case for them in a way that makes sense for them. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Well, I see that we're almost out of time. I do want to mention that there was one question um, for uh, Christy in particular uh, with regard to her remark around the um, importance of teacher uh, credentials and um, degrees. And Christy, do you want to take a few minutes just to um, respond to that, and then we'll, um, we'll close off? Sure. I don't want to take a few minutes. I'll try and be succinct. But um, the sound bite obviously doesn't convey enough richness behind the statement. 
Um, what, but we do have pretty extensive research from both first to five and K-12. So wherever you want to sit, sit kindergarten, there's a research base behind it. That degrees in and of themselves don't matter. This is actually why K-12 is going through this huge push around creating new teacher evaluation systems. We can't just measure, we can't just do a resume review to decide if a teacher is effective or not. So degrees in and of themselves don't matter, um, which is not an indictment of the degree necessarily, but more of institutions of higher ed and the wide vari variability of uh, teacher preparation programs offered. Um, but we also need to realize that by just saying degrees, many places don't even require a degree in education. So for example, a bachelor's degree in French doesn't translate into a high quality teacher. Um, and I would argue many degrees even from teacher preparation programs don't translate into high quality teaching. What we do know is that specialized degrees matter, and this is true in both birth to five and K-12. And degrees matter even more when they are coupled with coaching, focused professional development of the kinds that Jason uh, enumerated, teacher teamwork. So, but isolating degrees as sort of in and of themselves being a clear predictor of effective teaching and therefore improved child outcomes. As I said, there's just an abundance of research on, in both first to five and K-12. Thank you, Christy. Thank you very much. So um, that will end our question and answer period. And we're going to put up one last question for you to respond to. And while you do, I just want to give a special thanks to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and to the W.K. Kellogg Foundation for their support of the technology that has made this webinar possible. The next webinar, look for some information on the uh, pre-K to third grade Working Group website will be in April, and we will have we will post information on dates and content um, there very soon. So take a look for that. Um, thanks again to all of you for participating today, and um, we hope to have you on another on another flight soon. Um, thanks again, and have a great day. <laughs>